thanks for the kind invitation. In the next panel, we discuss about uh, the evolution of uh, emerging power in the actions. And we have uh, the presence of Tao, Tao Chen from Tsinghua University, China. Uh, Erika Downs, uh, Brooklyn Institution. Sergio Chichava from ES. Rhys uh, Jenkins, University of East Anglia. And uh, Paul Esteves, Puc Rio, uh, Briggs Policy Center. Well, according to the program, Tao Tao Chen will be the, the, the first speaker. Um, and I have, of course, some proposal. I know that investment is your favorite issue, but probably everybody of knows uh, we like to know about the evolution of economic reforms in, in China. According to Wen Yabao, economic growth model in China was unsustainable, uncoordinated, and unbalanced. So the reforms uh, were urgent. Um, these economies, economic and political reforms are very complex because they challenge relevant areas of political power in China. State banks, state-owner enterprises, local governments, in other words, high level officials in the party hierarchy. So probably reforms will be necessarily gradual and incremental. And the first question is, uh, in the short term, is there a cl clear signal of uh, progress in these uh, reforms? And linking with that, uh, corruption is uh, another issue in the Chinese debate. Uh, after the last uh, third plenum, the anti-corruption <laughs> campaigns have great diffusion in Chinese media. But the question is if these clear efforts are oriented to fight against the structural root, roots of the corruption or only cosmetic modification. In words of Xi Jinping, is this campaign affecting also the tigers or only affect mosquitoes? Some of the questions. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, President uh, Garcia for inviting me here. Uh, actually, um, I have to <coughs> disappoint you a little bit because I was given the, the topic like current trend of uh, trade and investment among Asia, Africa, and uh, Latin America. I know you might not want to know more about China, I guarantee to come back to you when you ask a question, okay? <laughs> I need to do my job, otherwise they won't invite me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Next time again. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm gonna do things relatively short because uh, this morning we had a wonderful discussion and some of the topics have been covered by them. So I just depend on the point, okay? Um, uh, regarding this topic, the current trend of the trade and investment among Asia, Africa and Latin America, I want to make three points. One, the growth trend is very true in absolute term. Second, the growth rate is relatively true. Third, how we make the trend sustainable. So actually for the first one, uh, this morning have, uh, many academics have already mentioned that um, the trade among these three regions really grow fast. And especially between the Asia, uh, with the uh, Africa and Asia with the Latin America. The uh, trade between the Latin America and Africa is relatively less, okay? And on the other side, and uh, if we talk about the investment, the volume of the investment cannot really match the uh, trade volume uh, among these three regions, but we still have a tremendous growth. Take China as an example, the Chinese o offshore FDI, uh, I mean, outward FDI, I mean, Chinese company going abroad, basically started to accelerate it uh, from 2004, and then uh, most of the uh, Chinese uh, investment uh, has been in the developing country, other than in the developed country. 
Uh, so from, from this fact, basically we have already realized the South country, we become more market to each other and we become more a capital source for each other. Actually, uh, from Chinese experience, I can see good reason for this trend. It's not temporary. Uh, I can identify like four, not drivers, area, okay? Uh, one, you can see from the demand area and the uh, national income uh, basically improved in many South countries. And also, the, the other thing is very important. The demand, the demand characteristic in the South country is relatively similar. So that's making more room for the product from South country. So that's one of the demand size. From the supply size, and many South country have already developed the human capital, technology, as well as infrastructure to some extent. So we can make more and better uh, product for each other. This is the second one. The third one I felt is very much important is that we actually, through all these years, development with we accumulated, we have accumulated the knowledge of how to make our own development. You know, beforehand, at the very beginning of China, when we do the reform, we look up the Soviet Union, we look up the uh, Korea and Japan, we look up US all the time, and we will listen to everybody, <laughs> okay? We test this and test that. And right now, we, ha uh, we sort of have more confidence. I'm not saying w we can get everything right, but we have more confidence to identify which uh, the advice could be more appropriate for us, which means we, uh, we have the capability to do our own direction, uh, to, to make our own decision, to figure out what is the right way to go. I think that's a very much important thing. The, third, the, 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 the fourth thing is that uh, the the, our South country, actually we found each other. We felt uh, we can cooperate more so that we can achieve more together. Uh, you can see the uh, agreement among South country uh, actually increased tremendously. So put everything together, I feel that the uh, fact right now <coughs> we've already seen is not a temporary one and we do have the good reason behind that. That's, uh, that's the one point. The second thing is that um, uh, the trend is relative one, for, from at least two perspectives. One is that we are still living in a, in a world dominated uh, by the developed country, which is two. Even though we are grow faster than them, but they are still take the biggest pie. The second thing is that actually, I believe almost every developing country, we start our development by the relationship with the developed world. They help us a lot. And this link is very strong, and we have already strengthened this link through the last um, decades. So uh, I, I think that's also, if you look at the trade and investment, and you can find a number that those part is actually stronger, uh, not, not weaker. They're just relatively slower, slower than the, 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 the things happen among us. So that is the, uh, why I said the, the, the growth trade is relatively true, okay? And then, uh, based on what I said just now, and I feel if we want to make the things, uh, this trend sustainable, there's only two way out. One is that we, um, we really need to cooperate more in the future. There are several uh, aspects, uh, several ways, not ways, that's in the several areas that really need to cooperate more. One, we do not really understand each other very much. And then we could be misunderstood for each other. For example, when Chinese company investing in, in, in Africa, and then uh, and they basically know Chinese company they accumulated uh, so many years experience in terms of doing infrastructure. You know we have improved a lot of infrastructure inside China, and they can do things better, and in a shorter time, and relatively cheaper, which is really good. But when a Chinese company is getting into Africa, and they have one more uh, requirement. They want Chinese company to immediately hire their local people. I really understand their demand, but uh, I have to explain to them, you know, uh, the infrastructure is so important for, to the country. And why China can do it uh, like what you described? Because China accumulated experience within their own team, okay? So why not just let them do the job first? 
And then, of course, you're going to train your people so that you can uh, remain your road and fix it. You know, the road is yours, OK? And then after so many years, and actually so many years experience, now there's so, uh, at least at the conference I attend, there's not so much this type of uh, question coming in. So, OK, uh, to, to put the long story short. So uh, we, we need to, we, 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 we find the room of improvement by improving mutual understanding among the South country. But secondly, we can share our experience of making development. That, that's, that's something that only can share um, among us. And, uh, and, and the third thing is that um, uh, we need to, I forgot. <laughs> just, just, uh, just. Anyway, uh, and, the other, and, and the other clear law is that uh, we need to strengthen our, uh, our time with the developed world. I think that's a very, very important thing uh, to do. And we'll try all our best not to be misunderstood by, you know, the growing south is against the declining of the north. This is really not the truth. We'll try all our best to avoid those type of misunderstanding. I think we need everybody to get together so that we can create the, the foundation for the sustainability of the, uh, the, the continued growth, the, ri the continued rise of the south. And of course, it's also the basic for the continued rise of the whole world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chao Chao, and the answer. We we'll wait for the next meeting. <laughs> Enrique, next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, we have the participation of uh, Erika Downs. We talk about China and Venezuela, trade, investment, and development, diplomacy. Uh, some guidelines with probably the same luck with the question posed to Tao Tao. Um, uh, good the, oh, sorry, sorry uh, w one point. The, the economic relationship between uh, China and Venezuela is increasingly important. However, there is little transparency in official data on bilateral trade investment and characteristic of uh, Chinese loans. Uh, right now, Venezuela is uh, facing strong inflationary pressures and a maxi devaluation risk. My point is, uh, is there awareness uh, of this scenario in Chinese uh, investors? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and I'd also like to thank COF and LSE for the opportunity to participate in this event. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, China Development Bank and its uh, growing global role uh, with a special reference to Venezuela, which is one of the bank's most important foreign customers. Uh, China Development Bank, uh, or CDB, has emerged as an increasingly important actor on the world stage since the global financial crisis. Uh, just to give you a few data points to put that in perspective, uh, China Development Bank's outstanding foreign currency loans, which are a rough proxy for its international lending, uh, grew from $65 billion in 2008 uh, to almost $250 billion last year. And for comparison, the World Bank's outstanding loans were $136 billion for fiscal year 2012 and $144 billion for fiscal year 2013. Uh, so in a very short period of time, China Development Bank has substantially ramped up its international lending. And the increase in the bank's lending is very much rooted in the global financial crisis when the commodity price collapse and the credit crunch provided the bank with an opportunity to substantially expand its international portfolio, uh, primarily through extending energy-backed loans uh, to borrowers in emerging economies, uh, including Brazil, Ecuador, Ghana, Russia, and Turkmenistan, and Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela is the largest recipient of oil-backed loans from China Development Bank, and the bank's engagement with Venezuela provides a window into its growing global activities. Uh, so what I'd like to do in the remainder of my time uh, is to quickly address uh, three questions that shed some light not only on the bank's relationship with Venezuela, uh, but also other emerging economies. Uh, and those three questions are, one, who is China Development Bank or CDB? Two, what is CDB doing in Venezuela and why? 
and, and three, what comes next for Venezuela and the rest of the world. So to begin, who is China Development Bank? Uh, well, CDB is a wholly state-owned bank uh, which aims to profitably advance China's national interests. Uh, it was one of three so-called policy banks created in 1994 uh, to handle state-directed lending. Uh, and the bank's primary mission is to support the Chinese government's medium and long-term development goals as the government understands those goals at any given time. Uh, domestically, the bank has bankrolled the development of strategic industries and much of the infrastructure that has underpinned China's economic boom. And internationally, CDB's priorities include helping Chinese companies enter foreign markets, securing access to energy and raw materials, uh, and broadly advancing uh, foreign policy goals. Uh, and it's important to note that while the banks is not solely motivated by profit maximization, uh, it does not want to support projects that will incur losses for the bank. So what is CDB doing in Venezuela and why? Uh, the bank has extended more than $45 billion in mostly oil-backed loans to borrowers in Venezuela. Uh, the biggest borrower in Venezuela is Vandis, or the Venezuelan uh, Bank for uh, Economic and Social Development, uh, and they have received uh, $36 billion um, from China Development Bank, and all of these loans are supported by oil supply contracts. Uh, and the bank has also uh, lent about $8.5 billion uh, to PDVSA, uh, the Venezuelan National Oil Company, and to CBG, uh, the Venezuelan uh, National Mining Company. And most of that money has gone to PDVSA. And it looks like some of these loans are some of these loans have been commodity backed. Uh, uh, others may not be. I haven't been able to, you know, confirm that each of these loans um, is indeed supported by a commodity supply contract. Uh, now, the, the $36 billion in oil-backed loans that uh, CDB has extended to Bandis account for more than one-third of the approximately $100 billion worth of energy-backed loans that CDB has extended to borrowers around the world since 2005. Now, why is China Development Bank doing this? Uh, there are a couple of reasons, and my bottom line here is that it's not simply about oil. Oil is part of the story, but there are other uh, national and corporate interests at play. Um, Obviously, one of them is oil. The contracts are supported by oil supply contracts. Uh, China's a big importer of oil, so there is a perception um, you know, in, in China that uh, these, these loans and the oil supply contracts that support them are good for China's oil security. Uh, but CDB is also making these loans uh, to help generate business for Chinese firms and to find new markets for China's exports. Uh, and some of the loans, um, for example, there was a loan back in 2010 that was a $20.6 billion loan, and half of that was issued in Chinese currency, which basically tied Venezuela into buying and hiring from China. And as a result of that, you see a lot of Chinese goods, you see trucks, you see rigs, vehicles uh, going into Venezuela. Um, and we also see Chinese companies undertaking projects in Venezuela. So, so supply, so, you know, to go over what, um, these loans are accomplishing for China. It's not just oil, it's business for Chinese firms, uh, and it's also new export markets. And this was very important to China uh, in the immediate wake of the global financial crisis when there was a sense we not, may not be able to count on the developed economies to buy as much stuff from us as they did in the past, so we need to find new markets and uh, extending loans that require other countries to buy stuff from us is one way to do that. Um, and finally, it's important to note that CDB itself has an interest here in that they look at their international business, they look at these uh, loan, these commodity-backed loans um, as providing a new engine of growth for the bank. You know, despite all the money it's lent abroad, this only constitutes about a quarter of its lending. Um, so 75% of its lending is domestic. Uh, a lot of it has gone for, uh, for infrastructure. And there's a recognition that even though China still has a lot of infrastructure left to build, there's still a lot of urbanization uh, that has to occur in China, um, there's a recognition that as this urbanization and infrastructure construction uh, you know, process uh, matures, that the bank is going to increasingly have to look for more opportunities overseas. Now, uh, when I first start, when, when, when China Development Bank first started lending to Venezuela, I got a lot of questions in Washington, D.C. Uh, why is China Development Bank doing this? They must be crazy. Venezuela seems like a pretty risky borrower. Um, and these, I think these concerns uh, became more acute and were voiced much uh, more often uh, after the death of uh, President Chavez last year. Um, I have noticed that the bank does ap has appeared over the last year uh, to be more reluctant to extend more lines of credit to Bandis. Um, I think that 
Initially, this probably had to do with um, uh, the, the death of Chavez and uncertainty about the political transition um, in Venezuela. Um, however, I don't think that's the case today. Uh, in part because uh, you know President Maduro appears to be appears to value um, his relationship with Venezuela and CDB as much as Chavez did. And so my sense is that the, the reluctance of CDB to extend uh, more lines of credit to Bandis uh, has more to do with Chinese concerns about uh, transparency and also about uh, Venezuela's ability to, to service new loans in the future. Um, we already heard a bit about the transparency issue, that there have been a lot of media reports um, about how you know, the bank is concerned, not, uh, not just about how the loans are being used, do they know where all the money's going, um, you know, but over the summer there were some reports about mismanagement um, of the funds from, from China and Venezuela. Um, and there's also concerns about does Venezuela have enough oil available for export to service new loans? Um, you know, this may sound crazy because Venezuela is sitting on a lot of hydrocarbon reserves, but from the Chinese perspective, the issue is those reserves are still in the ground. Uh, they're not barrels ready for export. Uh, Venezuelan production has declined since 2006, and a particular concern to the Chinese are that production increases at Chinese-invested uh, projects in Venezuela have been slower than expected, um, even though the, uh, the growth in <coughs> the, the development of these projects is not legally linked to any of the loans. My understanding is there's an expectation in China that we have companies involved there. Uh, hopefully they can grow Venezuelan production and that will enhance the country's ability to service our loans. Uh, and the progress that has been made has fallen short of what, what people uh, were hoping for. Um, and so I think this also contributes to the, to, to, to the reluctance to, to lend more. Um, it's important to note that China Development Bank did lend $4 billion to PDVSA, uh, the Venezuelan national oil company, last year. Um, but I view this as an entirely different type of project than lending to, to Bandis. Um, and I think for China Development Bank, this is a much lower risk project um, you know, for two reasons. One is that it involves a Chinese company, and the bank um, likes to lend to projects that involve Chinese companies um, they, as a risk management tool. Uh, and here, you know, there's a perception, there's a perception that if a Chinese company is involved and if the output of that product is going to be sold to China, in this case it's oil, um, then, you know, then, then that lowers the risk. Um, and there are also reports that, that, that the loan to, to PDVSA to support this joint venture oil project, um, that, that the Chinese will have more control over how that is used, that it's actually going to be the joint venture itself that manages the loan um, as opposed to just PDVSA um, or, or, or someone in Caracas. Um, and I've also heard that the loan is going to be dispersed incrementally depending on progress. So the $4 billion check isn't going to be written at once, um, that instead it's going to be dispersed in, in tranches. And so I guess finally, by way of conclusion, uh, you know, what comes next for Venezuela um, and the rest of the world in terms of CDB lending. Uh, for Venezuela, I think that CDB is likely going to be, uh, will remain reluctant to extend more lines of credit to Bandis um, if there continues to be little progress in ramping up uh, the country's oil production. Uh, that being said, um, I would not be surprised if the bank made more loans to PDVSA specifically for the purpose of ramping up that production, especially if there's a Chinese company involved. And it's important to note that this isn't something that's unique to, to China and Chinese companies, that there are other oil companies uh, like the U.S. firm Chevron, the Russian company Rosneft, that um, are lending money to PDVSA to support joint venture oil production projects in hopes of, 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 of increasing Venezuela's oil output. Um, globally, I think the bank will, will probably continue to provide commodity-backed loans to exporting countries who need infrastructure built and that have markets for Chinese goods because, as I mentioned earlier, such, such loans do advance a variety of interests for a variety of actors in China. Uh, that being said, although oil-backed loans grow CDB's balance sheet, at this point they're not doing a lot to enhance the bank's deal-making capabilities, just in part because it's done so many of them over the years. And you know, as the bank continues to look to play a larger role uh, on the world stage and to increase its deal-making capabilities, um, I expect the bank to look for opportunities to develop new skills, uh, including transactions um, in, in both emerging and developed economies. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Erika. 
And now Sergio Chichava will talk us about the role of uh, Brazilian cooperation in Mozambique's uh, agricultural sector. Two, two words uh, before. Um, for historical reasons, Brazil has always had uh, an interest link with, uh, with Africa. But in recent years, this has been reflected both uh, an increasing flow of trade and investment, as well as by cooperation in, 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 in novel ways. Brazilian investment in Africa is concentrated in petroleum, <coughs> mining, and large infrastructure projects, including ports, airports, and highways, and mainly in Angola, Mozambique, and, and Kenya. Right now, there are 34 large Brazilian enterprises operating in Africa. Africa receives 55% uh, of the disbursement made by Brazilian cooperation agencies. And Brazil has 35 embassies in Africa. So it's a very, very huge presence. In, and my question, I, I don't know about this issue, but my question is, what are the main differences between Brazilian cooperation and the European cooperation with Africa on this, on this area? Sergio? Um, thank you very much. Um, as uh, has been said, Uh, as has been said, uh, we'll talk about uh, the role of Brazil in Mozambique agriculture sector. And uh, first of all, I would like to apologize because of my uh, bad English, but I, I think uh, you will be able to understand what I have to share with you. And uh, the question uh, asked by the uh, chair uh, will be, uh, responded through my uh, presentation and uh, during the uh, discussion. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, the case of uh, uh, Mozambique and Brazil is very interesting case for those who want to understand uh, the Brazilian engagement in Africa. Because uh, Brazil, uh, or Mozambique is the top beneficiary of Brazilian technical cooperation in Africa. And I think in, because of that, it's a, an interesting case. And it's also uh, the main one of the main destinations of uh, Brazilian private capital. We have big companies like Val, for example, the second largest uh, mining company uh, in Mozambique, uh, who has, which has con concession in coal and phosphate. So, uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, the Brazilian uh, technical cooperation is concentrated in different areas like health, education, and agriculture. But agriculture is the main area of focus. That's why uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, interesting to talk about the role of Brazil in Mozambican agriculture sector. Uh, even if this uh, um, cooperation between Brazil and uh, Africa, and particularly with Mozambique, is very recent, and was driven by uh, President, the former President uh, Brasilia uh, Lula in the 2000s. Uh, there are some uh, patterns or trends in agriculture, Brazilian uh, agricultural cooperation in Mozambique, similar patterns or some patterns that we can, can be found. And I will just mention three. Uh, one of them is the Brazilian uh, trilateral cooperation in agriculture sector takes the form of a trilateral cooperation. And uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, cooperation is uh, made in Mozambique, uh, normally with uh, the called traditional donors, like Japan and the US. Obviously, uh, this kind of partnership raises some uh, questions. Uh, there are uh, a lot of debates, some of them asking if Br Brazil is a truly development partner or is a closer donor like the traditional one uh, from which it seeks to differentiate itself. Uh, another pattern that can be found when we look to the Brazilian uh, technical cooperation in agriculture sector 
is uh, the replication of Brazilian its own uh, successful experiences. Uh, it means that uh, the public policies in the agriculture sector, or which uh, went well in Brazil, are replicated in uh, other uh, in, in, in Mozambique. Um, but also, uh, this pattern is not uh, specific to the agriculture sector. It can be found also in the uh, other sector, like health. And also, it's not specific to the Mozambican case also can be found in uh, other uh, Brazilian South uh, partners. Uh, uh, what I can say that is unique in the uh, case of Brazilian uh, technical cooperation in, in Africa is the use of Mozambican case as a labor laboratory or a test case. Uh, it means that uh, uh, some uh, programs of Brazil uh, are being tested first in Mozambique before uh, tested in other African countries. Uh, among those programs, uh, Pro, Pro Savannah is undoubtedly the most uh, ambitious, the most uh, important uh, Brazil agricultural program in Mozambique and I can say in Africa. This program was initiated in 2011, and it is still in the res research planning in this te technical stage. And it is a trilateral uh, program uh, between uh, Japan, Mozambique, and Brazil, mm -hmm. and aims to transform uh, Nakala Corridor uh, the, uh, in the north of Mozambique, a region with uh, 4 million hectares into one of the most productive regions in the world. And it is inspired in a, a Brazilian and Japanese program, which was initiated in Brazil in the 70s, and transformed Brazil in one of the most productive uh, 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 countries in the world. But uh, although this program it is still in uh, its early phase, it is, it is facing strong criticism. Uh, by uh, local NGOs and uh, by uh, scholars uh, who says that this project uh, will not benefit uh, local population but will benefit uh, local uh, political and business elite. And uh, it will also benefit uh, the big capital. Uh, it is important uh, to note that this kind of concern are not without reasons when we look to the recent developments in, the, in Mozambique. Uh, in, this, in this country, most of the time, the main beneficiary of a foreign investment or foreign aid are uh, the people linked to the, to the local political elite and uh, uh, business elite. And uh, for example, if we look what is happening in the uh, area covered by uh, Pro Savannah program, we will see that actually there are at least four uh, large agribusiness companies. Three of these companies are foreign companies, but one of them uh, is, a, is a Mozambican company which is linked to the actual uh, Mozambican president. So uh, we can see that this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of concerns uh, uh, obvi obviously has some uh, reasons. Yeah. Equally, uh, Pro Savannah is criticized because uh, private and foreign investments are the main uh, dynamic forces within the programs, as it can be seen in uh, the official documents. So for the critics of, uh, uh, of this program, this contrasts with Brazilian discourse of solidarity diplomacy, where Brazilian cooperation is often presented as non-profit and unlinked to commercial interests. But uh, it's uh, a little bit uh, too early, I think, uh, to uh, draw definitive conclusion about what uh, will happen with Brazilian technical cooperation uh, in Mozambican agriculture sector. Uh, but what I can say uh, to conclude is, uh, as we all know, 
uh, Brazil has immense uh, knowledge on agricultural uh, development that it can, it can be shared with African countries. I think the question should not be whether uh, the programs are good or bad, but how to create the proper institutional uh, framework, policies, and the human capacity to ensure uh, better use of transferred technology in the context of Mozambique's socioeconomic environment. And uh, secondly, and uh, to conclude, the debate around uh, Pro Savannah, uh, as well as uh, Bra Brazil's broader impact in the agriculture sector, is linked to an intense argument on how to balance uh, small and large scale agriculture and foreign and domestic investment. This is a debate that has not yet been settled uh, in Mozambique. So, thank you. Thank you, Sergio. And now, Professor Jenkins will talk us about uh, South Africa and China assessing the impact of uh, asymmetrical engagement. Um, Professor Jenkins, uh, let me say only one minute that uh, Africa is facing an intense and rapid change. Uh, for Latin America, it's not surprising to see that uh, our region is lagging behind age and performance. But probably it's more surprising to take note that uh, African GDP growth and export growth in Africa is higher than Latin America during the last 10 years. Uh, Africa chose a strong run of economic growth, a huge demogra demographic transformation, the expansion of a uh, new African middle class, and uh, explosive growth of new cities and mega cities. And probably Professor Jenkins may help us to understand what is the mix between internal and external factors that explain this uh, good performance. Professor? Okay, thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel today. Um, there was in this morning's sessions, there was quite a lot of mention of South-South cooperation um, and what that might involve, um, and also some questions about, well, what exactly we mean by the South, and um, we're reminded by um, Chris Walden that it's not just an economic concept, but it also has um, other wider um, interpretations and political ideological connotations. And in a sense, although I'm going to be looking at the economic aspects, I think th these will raise some of the, the kind of contradictions between, um, if you like, the, the ideological and the material elements of um, South-South cooperation. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about the relationship between two of the BRICS, um, South Africa and China. Um, and I'm not sure that I will answer the chair's um, concerns, because South Africa is not typical of the rest of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, that's what I want to focus on today. The um, relationship between South Africa and China is a fairly recent one. In fact, it's only 16 years since um, South Africa recognized um, the People's Republic of China um, under the apartheid government in South Africa uh, it maintained diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Um, but since then, um, and particularly since um, the early China joining the WTO in 2001, there's been a very rapid um, move closer together between um, South Africa and China, and particularly, of course, in terms of economic relations. Trade um, has grown very rapidly between, between the two. Um, in um, the late 1990s, trade between China and bilateral trade between China and South Africa was about $1 billion. Um, by the last couple of years, it's up to about $25 billion. Um, South Africa, China rather, became South Africa's most significant export market. 
um, in 2009, and also um, it became South Africa's most significant, largest um, supplier of imports. So um, economically, the, the two countries have become much closer together. The, um, and of course, uh, politically as well, although not originally a member of the BRIC um, group of countries in 2010, South Africa was invited to join um, the BRICS and, um, and the last summit of the BRIC countries was held um, in South Africa. So, um, and there are various, you know, the frequent um, travel uh, state visits by both the presidents of South Africa and China's um, political leaders, um, mutual visits on a fairly regular basis. So clearly there's been uh, a very rapid expansion um, of engagement between the two, um, the two countries. But nevertheless, um, what I want to suggest, or what the title I was given actually suggests, is that this is an asymmetric, um, an asymmetric engagement. Um, Would you like to take some and of course, this is more, I mean, in one very obvious sense, it's asymmetric in that uh, China is a much larger country in terms of population and in terms of GDP than South Africa. And so uh, while uh, China is very important for South Africa, uh, South Africa is not so important for China, although South Africa is China's biggest trading partner in Africa. Um, nevertheless, in terms of its world position, it's not, you know, it's not on the same kind of scale. And that's an inevitable consequence of the, the differences in um, sizes of the two economies. Um, but beyond that, I think there are two ways in which one can talk about um, an asymmetry, and I'm going to focus uh, particularly on the trade relationship between South Africa and, and China, the, the way in which this is asymmetrical. Firstly, I hadn't realized that um, Davos style meant that you didn't have PowerPoints, so you have to imagine my graph showing the <laughs> growth of trade uh, between South Africa and, and, um, and China. But what it shows was um, that consistently South Africa has run a trade deficit with China. Its exports have not um, kept pace with um, imports from China, unlike some other sub-Saharan African um, economies that export natural resources. Um, so, so there's that sense in which trade is unbalanced between the two. And as, as President Jacob Zuma pointed out at the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation Meeting in Beijing in 2012, um, it's an equal relationship based on South Africa exporting primary um, products or raw materials to China um, was not a sustainable relationship. So this asymmetry, which again, um, Carlos Omnami pointed to in his comments this morning in relation to Latin America, whereby the main interest of uh, China in uh, the region is to do with the acquisition of raw materials and the pattern of trade, as he put it, is very much the kind of center periphery pattern of Latin America, and in this case, South Africa, exporting primary commodities. About 80% of South Africans' exports to China are either um, primary products, un totally unprocessed, or processed raw materials. So the bulk of exports are of those kind of traditional center-periphery kind of trade um, patterns, whereby, of course, China's exports to South Africa are, are, are very much um, manufactured almost exclusively not surprisingly, manufactured goods. Um, and that's been a matter of, of concern. Um, in South Africa recently, the um, Deputy Minister for the Trade and Industry in South Africa um, visiting China also commented on the need for um, more balanced and more sustainable trade relationship between the two countries. Um, and what I want to, you know, to elaborate on that slightly I want to share with you some of the results of some research that I did with, um, with a colleague, Lawrence Edwards, at the University of Cape Town, looking at the impacts of the relationship um, between China and South Africa was having on the South African manufacturing sector. And if anybody's interested, I've got a briefing paper, a few copies of a briefing paper, which you know, I can provide you with, which gives more detail on, on that research. Um, 
And the two real aspects that we focused on, particularly in the way in which China um, was affecting the South African manufacturing sector, and I think the importance of looking at the manufacturing sector is related to comments again that I think the um, Osvaldo Rosales made um, this morning about uh, the need for structural transformation or productive transformation in developing countries, and clearly a, a key role in that being played by the manufacturing sector. So what's been the impacts of manufacturing on manufacturing in South Africa? Well, there are two dimensions to it, or two aspects that we looked at particularly. Um, one was the increased penetration of the domestic market, South African market, by Chinese imported goods, which although in aggregate it only accounted for about 6% of total um, consumption of manufactured products in South Africa, clearly much more significant in certain sectors in footwear clothing was over 40% and a lot of electrical products over 30% of the market was accounted for by imports of South Africa of, of products from China. Um, and although part of that came because things were being imported from China rather than from other countries, and the bulk of it was to do with a reduction in the market share of domestic production. Um, and what made it particularly um, concerning, of course, was the fact that um, the impact that it had on industrial employment, because of course clearly in South Africa one of the key issues has been the level of unemployment. 25% in official figures for unemployment, 35% or more um, if a broader definition is used. So employment creation is critical in the South African economy. And again, there was reference made to problems in the, in this morning more widely than to do with employment. And because a lot of the competition faced uh, by South African manufacturers has tended to be in relatively labor intensive um, sectors of industry. That has meant that employment has been quite uh, significantly affected. And we estimated in our studies um, that between 2001 and 2010, there was a loss of about 75,000 um, jobs in the manufacturing sector in South Africa over that period. Um, another aspect that we thought was worth looking at um, which doesn't get as much attention, um, perhaps, as it deserved, was th the effect that competition from China was having on South African exports of manufactured goods to other markets, particularly exports to um, other countries in sub-Saharan Africa, um, where uh, South Africa has developed over the last, well, since the ending of apartheid, particularly, um, significant export markets in the region. Uh, and these have tended to be relatively more sophisticated industrial exports as well. And again here, um, what we found that was South Africa was losing market share to China in the 10 biggest, 10 most significant markets um, for South Africa in the region. And we estimated that if it hadn't been for competition from China, they would have had about 10% more exports to these markets um, in the absence of Chinese competition. So although that's not such a serious problem given that the markets have grown quite rapidly anyway, so although in relative terms there'd been a lost market share to, to China, in absolute terms South Africa still managed to increase its exports of manufactured goods. Um, but that was the kind of context that I, that I want to put that, you know, on the one hand we have a lot of talk and ideologically there's a lot of talk about uh, cooperation uh, between southern countries and that's very characteristic of discourse around cooperation between or the relationship between China and South Africa and may well be true in certain areas. But in this key area of trade and the impacts on manufacturing, it seems to be not following that kind of the original idea of South-South cooperation, which was to break away from a particular kind of international division of labor. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rice. And now, Paulo Esteves from PUC, Pontificial Universidad Católica de Rio, Brazil, will talk us about uh, IPSA, India, Brazil, South Africa, and BRICS in comparative purposes. As a good Latin American, we negotiate the, the question, not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Paulo chose uh, two <coughs> briefly. First, in trade area. None of the BRICS countries are parties of the, to the MIGA regional negotiations that are underway, such as the TPP and the TTPIP. 
So in the future, what uh, possible economic trade scenario can be forcing over the next several years in terms of the interaction between WTO, these mega regional agreements, regional integration processes, and BRICS activities? And second, uh, financial area. After hard negotiation four years ago, BRICS within G20 obtaining some small reforms in the quotas and the representation of developing countries in the International Monetary Board. Last week, United States Congress rejected all these minor reforms, coming back to the previous situation, and practically closing <laughs> the door for several years for international uh, financial reforms. In your opinion, what should be, if any, the response of free countries to this issue? Paolo. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, two uh, prior remarks. Uh, the first one, I, I have to express my gratitude to CAF uh, and LSC uh, for, for inviting me. Uh, the second remark is as, um, as, uh, as Sergio, I have to uh, say to you guys that I'm going to, uh, let's say, not, not, not doing a good job of uh, your native language. Sorry about that, uh, and that is uh, more pressing every time I'm in London, and I have to uh, impose all the mistakes, uh, grammar mistakes, pronunciation mistakes, that I will uh, do with you. And there's times, every time it happens, I, I resent a little bit not to be uh, colonized by the Spanish. Uh, if we speak Spanish uh, in Brazil, it would make things really, really, really easier for us, uh, at least at th this point we could have uh, a simultaneous translation and, ever, and uh, <coughs> even talking in Spanish, uh, much, more, much more people could understand us. Uh, let's go to the point, I, my, <coughs> my uh, uh, main job here is try to explore the difference between BRICS uh, and IPSA. I have to tell you my computer just died uh, uh, with my notes, but I have some here. Uh, uh, I think they can help me. Uh, I will try to explore this difference uh, 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 among or around uh, three different dimensions. The first one uh, uh, is are related to goals and meanings of uh, <coughs> BRICS and, uh, and IPSA. The second one uh, is related to the impacts of BRICS and IPSA. IPSA. Uh, and the third one, uh, uh, the third dimension is related to the prospects for BRICS, as for, for BRICS and, uh, and, uh, and IPSA in the near future. Uh, Regarding goals and, uh, and meanings of, uh, <coughs> of BRICS, uh, BRICS and, uh, and IPSA, uh, uh, there is a, a, a small story I'd like to tell. Uh, it's related to the recent uh, Snowden uh, issue. Uh, and there is, a, I think it is a, a, a good to discuss this or to, to mention this here after President Obama uh, has had a, 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 a Sorry, <coughs> after President Obama uh, start to support more strongly the policies uh, that the information community are uh, 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 taking in the United States. Uh, Brazil reacted to uh, the NSA issue uh, with two different uh, courses of action or two different uh, 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 lines of action. The first one uh, was go to the General Assembly at the UN and try to pass a resolution, uh, try to approve a resolution uh, in which the, the right of, a, of a privacy uh, could be considered a human right. Uh, the second action was uh, directed towards BRICS and it would be the construction or the building up of uh, what they are calling now BRICS cable or an alternative structure for the internet to face or to compete uh, with the Western or American one, if you, if you want. <coughs> uh, I do think that if we think that the first pattern of action go to a uh, more universal or multilateral, at least, uh, forum and try to play with universal norms uh, or with the, 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 this game of uh, particular and particular interests and univer universal norms. If we think about this pattern of uh, behavior, uh, you are going to have 
something really close to IBSA. If you think about balancing and if you think about building up alternative institutions to uh, either compete or at least defy the, the, uh, the current stru structures of power, you are going to think about BRICS. Uh, taking uh, freely uh, 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 Chris's uh, uh, presentation this morning, I would say both of them are coming from uh, the, the 2.0 South or to the South 2.0 uh, because you are actually playing with universal norms as a way to protect yourself or to, uh, to be protected against the asymmetry of power in, uh, within the international system. But at the same time, some of these countries in the global South, they start to compete uh, more openly uh, with the Western uh, 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 based or oriented international system, <coughs> if you want. The, the difference between BRICS and IBSA, uh, or the meanings uh, uh, of uh, BRICS and IBSA, can also be uh, understood if we, if, if we uh, uh, notice that most of the descriptions about, or most of the analysis about IBSA uh, refers to India, Brazil, and South Africa as middle powers, while uh, the mo most of the analysis about BRICS refers to China, uh, sorry, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa as rising powers. There is a huge difference, I, 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 I think, between middle powers and rising powers. Middle powers are uh, a kind of uh, uh, global players in the making. They uh, aspire to, to be global players. They aspire to have uh, more, more and more influence in, uh, within the international system, but they don't have the means to do that. Uh, while rising powers, they, are, uh, uh, they imagine themselves or they are described uh, as uh, actors that could uh, one way or another interfere or intervene uh, within the international system and change it. Uh, <coughs> I do think this is, uh, this is the main difference between uh, BRICS and IPSA. Uh, not only power uh, are in the DNA of both institutions, both IBSA and, I and, uh, and BRICS uh, are political institutions, but BRICS is a, an institution created to reform or at least, uh, sorry, uh, to reform or even to balance the international, uh, the international system. Uh, in, the, in, in that sense, uh, it's not only, BRICS is not feed, feed only by power, but by the idea of power transition uh, within the international system. Uh, in terms of the impacts, and that's the second dimension uh, uh, I would like to tackle, uh, in terms of the impacts, the impacts of, of uh, IBSA <coughs> are, are really, really, really uh, 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 modest. Uh, IBSA has now uh, several working groups, intergovern intergovernmental uh, working groups. They are more or less consistent. Uh, IBSA has a fund uh, to fight poverty and, uh, and hunger, uh, but the results of this fund are really, really, really modest. Uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, IBSA has a forum, a business forum, and an academic forum whose uh, uh, results are um, really uh, detrimental. Uh, compared to BRICS, uh, we could say about BRICS that BRICS doesn't have uh, any good or any significant result or impact either. But if we think about global governance, uh, and if we, if we recall that BRICS, they articulate themselves uh, in the, the Security Council uh, in order to uh, block the Security Council regarding Syria, uh, we are going to see that this is a really, really, really important impact, I think. Uh, if, we th if we think that uh, uh, BRICS are uh, creating or that they are offering uh, the world, especially Africa, uh, alternative models of development than those uh, exported uh, by Europe and the United States. 
Uh, and uh, if you think that these alternative models of, uh, of development, they are being carried on uh, throughout South-South cooperation, we are going to see that the impacts of the BRICS are really significant. And if we, uh, in terms of uh, develop the development co cooperation field, I think this might be the, the, most, uh, the most important effects of BRICS. Uh, there is a, a line I heard the other day uh, which says that uh, in the future, or now, if you want, uh, all, 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 uh, all of us are BRICS. Why is that? Because the, uh, the European Union and the OECD region are adopting the same pattern of behavior that the BRICS countries uh, were adopting a while ago. So the, the, the Paris agenda of uh, 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 eff effective uh, aid is being abandoned uh, uh, and is being abandoned uh, for the sake of fostering private inv investments in Africa and uh, in the South. So in that sense, uh, the model that, uh, 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 that, were, that were, uh, was adopted by the BRICS, especially by China and perhaps by Brazil, as uh, Sergio uh, uh, shown, showed, uh, uh, these models are being adopted in the North. So I do think that this is a huge impact. Uh, regarding the question uh, of uh, the rejection uh, uh, of the reforms in the, in the IMF, right? <coughs> in the IMF, uh, <coughs> this is an import important issue in the agenda, but, uh, and this is uh, the way I, I'm going to the third dimension, the dimension uh, related to the prospects. Uh, uh, it is an important uh, item in the BRICS agenda, but it is importantly, is it, it is important in a very heterogeneous way. It is important for Brazil, it might be important for India, it might be important for South Africa, but it, is not, it, 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 it isn't important at all for China. Uh, China didn't push that much to the, the reform of the, uh, of the IMF, and some of the other BRICS countries, they resent that a lot. And that's uh, exactly the way I'm trying to tackle, I will try to tackle the prospects for the BRICS. What are the BRICS? Are the BRICS uh, a group of uh, rising powers or are the BRICS uh, a group of uh, middle powers around one rising power? Uh, if we think the way uh, IBSA was described, uh, uh, <coughs> let's say in terms of a draw, we can think about IBAS, IBSA, sorry, uh, IBSA in, uh, in, uh, as a form of a butterfly. Uh, there is India, there is uh, Brazil, and there is South Africa in the middle. If you think about uh, uh, the BRICS, we are going to think about a circle with a center. The relations between the BRICS, or Brazil, uh, uh, Russia, uh, India, and South Africa, South Africa, in terms of trade, for instance, are not that great. Uh, the relations of each of these countries, as in the case of South Africa, with China, are really important for each one of them. So what we are, we are seeing uh, in the BRICS is a kind of dependence uh, uh, from the periphery of the BRICS to uh, the center of the BRICS. Uh, it's not a matter of uh, 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 the integration of chain of values. It's a matter of, uh, uh, if you want, uh, uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, division of labor, which is highly asymmetrical uh, among uh, the BRICS countries. So in terms of the prospects of the BRICS, uh, for the BRICS, I would say the BRICS uh, have a very important impa impact in, in, the, in the international order. The BRICS are, uh, in a way, undermining uh, some of the most important uh, institution in, institutions in, in the international order, such as the Security Council, for instance, uh, such as uh, the, regime of, uh, the regime for uh, 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 development assistance. Uh, and uh, instead of uh, building up new institutions or new norms, the BRICS are actually just uh, weakening the existing, uh, the existing one. And this might be good for the strongest, but it is not that good for the weakers. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, among these uh, 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 weakest countries, I would say uh, I would put some countries like South Africa, India, and uh, Brazil. India, I'm not sure, but at least South Africa and Brazil uh, could be uh, grouped uh, 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 among the weakest and uh, the weakening of the international order is not a good thing for such con for countries like uh, like those thank you very much thank you
Thank you, Paulo. It's very interesting to take note that uh, within the BRICS, probably we have center and periphery too. <laughs> huh? <laughs> so the first round is uh, complete. The floor is open for answer, comment. I'll follow up on your, your presentation. Uh, what's the real situation of the, the bank, the BRICS bank, and I'll tell you, uh, we as CAF, we were the, the, the Chinese uh, government uh, and the authorities in India and Brazil. The three of them uh, asked us to make consultations about how the structure, governance, uh, how CAF built up itself. And we have been in several meetings, but we didn't see much advance in, in recent times. Do you have any specific comments on the situation of that? And what is the the, the feasibility or the complementarity, you know, in the case, for instance, of an institution like, uh, like mine or, the, or the, the African Development Bank, whatever, it's very clear what you can do. Now, in the, in the case of the BRIC, what type of institution will be a valid one? I don't know if you can answer that. Would be a valid, valid yeah, one? Yeah. What is the value of, added, um, you know, among themselves? You know, may, maybe you can play a role. If you have a pool of resources, of course, you can play a role in globally, but uh, in the cooperation between them among themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, how do you see that? It's, um, I think this is your, um, an open question. Uh, I do, uh, 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 what I can say is that I, I cannot name them. It was a Shetland House rules, but uh, I heard several comments from uh, people from different countries uh, that the model that the, the BRICS Bank should follow was, is exactly CAF. Uh, I heard that several, several times from uh, different sources. I just wanted you to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tripe away, tripe away investment bank. Uh, it's I don't, I don't very it, efficient, right? yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I heard uh, exactly that uh, that kind of comment. Uh, the main uh, the main uh, I, 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 what I can say is um, it's old. Uh, it comes from uh, it's dated in uh, November. The information is uh, from November. Uh, you probably have uh, fresh information, the fresher information than that. Uh, uh, but what I can say is that uh, they are, were thinking about a initial installment of 10, million, uh, 10, uh, 10 billion uh, uh, dollars for each country. Uh, the entire fund would be 50 billion. Uh, it would be equal, equal. Uh, so in terms of governance, uh, there will be a, a, a isonomy uh, between the countries. Uh, and. Uh, uh, regarding the role uh, of the bank uh, is not, not even at the Brazilian position. I cannot say not even the Brazilian position. It's a, a position that I heard in Brazil for several players. Uh, they think that the bank uh, could be open to uh, lend money for anyone in a while, but now just for countries, uh, probably just the BRICS, but perhaps the African countries as well. Uh, so that's, that was the, 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 the latest uh, news I have. Uh, the other thing I heard is that we are talking about a four year uh, time, timeline to, to, to the bank to be oper uh, operative, uh, uh, and, uh, but something will come up uh, in July uh, during the summit. Uh, not, not, not the entire architecture, but something would, would come up in uh, July. I, I know you know you know more than I, but nevertheless. Karin the friend, you and you. Just a quick follow-up to President Garcia's question. Parallel with the BRICS Bank, or before that, there was a G20 initiative <coughs> of a global infrastructure bank, and then the BRICS Bank came. Could you sort of using your model? look at pros and cons of a G20 sponsored bank, infrastructure bank versus World Bank, say, or the regional banks, vis-a-vis -vis the BRICS bank, 
because some of the Asian capital that I hear from, it doesn't seem the Asian powers are very keen to put money, really, into the bridge line. That's tough. Uh, <coughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, I didn't know the idea of, uh, of um, uh, 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 G20 infra infrastructure bank. Uh, I think the rationale is uh, it's almost the same. Uh, one thing that is, uh, is being said about the BRICS banks is, that is exactly that it is a bank uh, devoted to fund infrastructure. The main, uh, the main projects in the main areas would be uh, related to infrastructure. So uh, I, don't, I don't think I can use my model because my, my model there is a, uh, in my model there is a, another component I didn't mention that. Uh, uh, it assumes that we are not talking about, when we talk about BRICS, we are not talking about so South any longer. Uh, we are talking about at least the North of the South, uh, but it is not, it's not the same. It's, mm. we, we cannot treat South as a homogeneous thing. So in terms of uh, 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 the BRICS being part of, a, of a, the G20 and being part of a, a bank, uh, G a G20 bank would be a, a really good stand. Uh, it would. I, I don't. I don't think it would be a problem. I don't know what happened uh, in the negotiation. I'm looking at you, and I. I know that you know. You. you <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, my. My. I, I'm not sure if it, uh, if the uh, the BRICS were the ones who actually uh, veto or, uh, or who actually uh, 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 impose some kind of ob of obstacles to 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 build to the building up of the bank of the G20 bank. Uh, uh, my feeling. Is that they they wouldn't they wouldn't they wouldn't be uh, against it against the idea uh, uh, because uh, when we talk about BRICS we are talking about countries that w wish or they, that want to be part of the oligarchy that's that's simple as that I, I guess it's thank you, thank you Mr Moderator let me move away from the BRICS equation <laughs> and talk about China Africa. Um, we commend China for the great things they are doing in Africa, in particular infrastructure. Um, but there are, there are some important questions are being raised. One, for example, is why are some countries using oil to pay for their infrastructure? I see no problem in that. It's a, you either pay in cash or some any other form. The problem will only come if really they are not getting fair value for the oil that they are using. So I think that's the question that we want to know. Uh, they are, is if they are paying market rates, it's, it's, there is no problem there. I think she should respond. She raised it. The second is that um, China t buys raw materials from Africa. I say, welcome to the club. Who doesn't do that? The Europeans are buying our raw materials. So it's a question of really Africa putting its act together and you know selling value added, putting value addition to the raw material and selling it. So th that one is not unique. Where I have problems with China is the issue of capacity building, where you are saying that there's a trade-off between speed of implementation and your willingness to train. I don't think that's negotiable. I think really uh, when you have projects, you should, you know, you should really uh, put in a component for capacity building. Because who, who is in a hurry to deliver? Is it the Chinese side or is it the African side? Who, who, wants, who wants this? And if the African side is, we want you to develop a, an infrastructure project, but in that context we want you to train our people, then don't, don't, that shouldn't be an issue for you. That the question of you know, the speedy and, and, and quick implementation should not be a trade-off for capacity building. So I think in most of your projects, you should really aim to put in capacity building. That certainly, that's the only aspect that I, I find, you know, a bit controversial and one want to hear your comments on it. Thank you. Okay, I think, I think that this question is open for all panelists because probably it's one of the main issues concerning the relationship between China, Africa, and China and uh, Latin America. In Latin America, one of the main concerns is it's similar. It's referred to of repeating with China 
the central periphery story that the region had with uh, England in the 19th century and the United States in the 20s, and Europe in the case of, of Africa. So, if you want, <laughs> what is the, the approximation to of China to, um, to, to, to this issue? Uh, how, how do you see the, you the, this first question? Then. Okay, I, I'll you start. First? Um, I'm happy to start. I'll take the, the first issue of why pay in oil. Um, I think that there are both China Development Bank and the Export Import Bank of China um, have extended a number of commodity, including oil backed loans, to borrowers around the world. And it's, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's, it's not simply because uh, China's a big importer of oil, but for the banks that make these loans, they view uh, uh, commodity-backed loans as a risk management tool um, because they say that if they, you know, they can track the flow, the, the oil exports uh, from the country, and that gives them a really good idea of the, the country's cash flow. And, and I should mention that, um, that, that China Development Bank and China Exim Bank aren't unique in doing this, that you have a lot of international banks that make oil-backed loans. And I think, uh, you know, Angola is a great example of this, that if you sort of go back 10, you know, 12 years to the end, end of the Civil War there, that some of the first international banks that if you look at, you know, Societe Generale um, and institutions like that, Standard Chartered, they were making oil-backed loans to the government in, of Angola, and that was simply because because uh, due to all the uncertainty with the end of, of the war there, that they felt that these structured financings were the only type of business that they wanted to do in that market. So I think even though a lot of the discussion of the oil back loans <coughs> from China, um, you know, sort of don't, don't take into consideration this histor historical context, it's not a uniquely Chinese thing, although China also has the history of um, being a borrower. Um, and um, borrowing from Japan and paying back those loans with commodities um, in the 1970s. So I think that's that's the why pay. I think that's the why pay with oil. That it's not simply we're an oil oil importer and we could use the supplies, but for the individual institutions involved in the lending, um, it's a it's a risk management tool. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say something? Okay, sure. Um, I'd just like to add to that in terms of the oil question. I mean. Presumably one of the issues too is transparency, isn't it? I mean, but then you don't really know what the terms are when it's done, but that's not irresolvable. It's just, just an issue that, that comes out of it. Um, about the other point about, well, the, that you make about, well, it's the same as trade with Europe. Um, I mean, that's partly the point uh, that I was making, uh, firstly, and that's, you know, there, there is the claim that South-South trade is somehow different, um, and what appears to be the case is that if you look at the structure of it, it is the same. Actually, it's it's not exactly the same. I mean, it may, in in, in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, yes, you're, you're probably right. In South Africa and in Latin American countries as well, actually, the, the proportion of exports to China that are primary products and, and processed raw materials are higher than the exports of those same countries to the rest of the world. Okay, so so there there is for South Africa and for the, the, the Latin American countries there is a bit of a difference in that. <laughs> Ironically, I guess the trade mm -hmm. with China is even more centre periphery type trade than trade with the rest of the world. Enrique, yes, yeah. Enrique, just just a brief comment about the former. Uh, issue which was discussed with the excellent presentation of Paolo. In fact, I never understood, frankly speaking, the role of a bank within the BRICS uh, mandate. I mean, so many banks already, the World Bank, regional banks. I would imagine BRICS to be a potential political power uh, trying to intervene on major blockages of the whole governance. Uh, you see, I would see BRICS mobilizing WTO blockade or negotiations on, 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 on climate change, or, or you know, even, even to go into the United Nations structure. This is the type of uh, power which I would like to see. But my impression is that these, these, the fields are not ready yet for that kind of movement. But the creation of a bank, but you see, we have so many banks, there are capital markets. And the same happens in Latin America with UNASUR Bank. 
Mm -hmm. That's a big idea. I, mean, I think uh, this to me will not be the role of, uh, on the contrary, I think it diminishes its it major capacity of action, which is to intervene in the goal, with the governance of the world and blocking things with the political powers of, of the majority of, uh, of, of the world uh, in population and, and economic power. So just to say that uh, really the, the bank is not something which I would be very much expecting. Uh, can I come back? Okay. Please, please, please. Just, just, just quick answer to, to the to the to the gentleman. Uh, one thing is about the pay by the oil. I think there's a two level issue. One is, uh, is that okay? Is that okay? All right. There's a two level of issue. One, whether it's uh, logical, whether we have the reason to do that. The second is the uh, whether you can do it in the right way. Okay. Then for the first level. I would like to ask, if you do not pay for the oil, is there any other alternative? If you have another alternative, I don't think Chinese company really prefer you pay by oil. You can pay by cash or you can, uh, you know, whatever, okay? Yeah, okay, yeah. No, no, no. I'm, not, I'm not making argument, okay? I'm just to uh, answer your question. That's, that's I think, it's, uh, logical to pay in oil. I actually was very impressed by one of the leaders from Africa in an international investment forum. He said that uh, we realize that right now, the, even we are rich in resources, but resources can't run out in the end, right? So we want to use our resources to change the development opportunity. I really appreciate that. It's exactly the same as China. At the very beginning, we said we want to use our market to change the technology. It's just exactly the same. So I think the, the main thing is how to make it in right. It is more technically, we are improving that, I think. That's one thing. The other thing is the capacity. I think it's, I do believe most of the Chinese instruction company right now, they are in doing intensively training for local, uh, local people. I do have that number, but I didn't bring that with me, right? So I believe if you talk about specific project, they might like because they sign the contract according to their capacity. So they, they're gonna do the first job by their own people because they also allow them to do that. And then at, along with that, they train your people so that they can use more and more local people to be with them. And in the end, when they finish the job, and then most of the team go back, and then they remain all the job for the local people. I think that's the thing that they are, they're doing right now. I believe that's the right direction to go. And it's exactly the same thing for the Latin America so far. And they have very strict uh, regulation that they cannot, uh, the Chinese company cannot bring their own people there. So that's why a lot of the production cannot be happening. So this, that's exactly the truth. I'm not saying who is wrong, who is right, but that's just exactly the truth, mm -hmm. yeah. And the third thing is the IB. Uh, it's like what China is doing is like uh, many years ago. Uh, I happen to be the international business professor, <laughs> okay? Now, the business principle inside this world is according to the uh, supply chain management, right? So the global supply chain, how to distribute among the country, is actually depend on the location advantages of each country. China happened to be at the, at the value chain that, you know, just, in, okay, let me do it this way. The, the Latin American country and African country, so far, okay, you are, your advantages is the resources. You haven't developed enough your location advantages for the rest of the supply chain. That is why, including other foreign company, they doing exactly the same thing. They invest in these two areas, and then they get the resources, and then bring to other places, including China, to do other part of the value chain. I do understand your concerns. So I think the key thing right now, we're talking about the business. We're not talking about the government aid or something. Business is business. So uh, the only thing that you can get the foreign company, including Chinese company, to do the part of value chain in your country you're gonna try to raise the factor inside that part. For example, let me give you a simple example. 
this, I do not want to mention the country, okay, uh, in, inside Latin America. One Chinese company, they can do business relatively easy in one Latin country, and it's a little bit difficult in another Latin country. And I visit both of them. And the, the reason is very simple. In one country, they really lack off the qualified engineering. So they have to call constantly from home to support the business there. But in the other country, they all told me that you know they do have the qualified people there. And then, then the Chinese company, they, they even <coughs> told me that if they can find someone can be the leader for the branch in that country, they're gonna do that. So I do believe the, the government of our South country have a really heavy responsibility on our shoulder. We need to improve our own conditions so that we can really attract the foreign investment as what you wish. That, that's my answer. And I have one additional quick point on the, the capacity building issue um, that builds on what Dr. Chen said. I think that when a lot of Chinese companies started investing overseas, they viewed overseas as, an invest, as a way to enhance their own capacity. So they were focused more on building up their own mm -hmm. skills than those of the people in the country they were invested in. And, and just to give an example, um, when China National Petroleum Corporation went into Sudan in the 1990s, um, that generated a number of articles in Chinese oil industry publications about how what they did in Sudan should be used as a model for investment elsewhere because they were able to bring a large number of workers to Sudan and give those workers international experience that the company really valued. Um, and you know, what was interesting to me is that that's that their view that foreign investment should be a training ground for our workers generally isn't the view of host countries who often say, okay, if you're gonna come invest here, is there something you can do um, you know, to help citizens of our country? And so I think that we've come, and even though I think some Chinese companies still look to make investments to gain, to, you know, to build capacity, to gain know-how, there is a recognition that, um, you know, that they do need to build some capacity. And I think that the example that Dr. Dr. Chen gave was a good one of that. So I think you know, in a relatively short period of time, of 15 years or so, we have definitely <coughs> seen an evolution I think in the approach of Chinese companies. Thank you. <coughs> let, let me add some additional example about the capability construction. One of the main concerns in Latin America in relation with, the Lat with China connection is the lack of uh, export diversification. I have uh, attended uh, the seven events of uh, China Latin American Business Summit, and this is a classic issue in this uh, discussion. But China, Chinese authorities are absolutely open to discuss this issue. But not only that, Wen Yabao, former prime minister, when talking in our building, in, in ECLA building, uh, suggested a very, very integrated agenda of cooperation between China and Latin America, including infrastructure, um, joint venture in manufacturers, uh, in services, uh, upgrading agricultural technology, and so on. So, well, after four years of this uh, proposal, Latin America has not response. In uh, 2008, China issued the white paper about the relationship with uh, Latin America, including economic, political, tourism, and, and several issues. After six years, Latin America has no res collective response. So, my opinion, it's our responsibility to define what are the best way to make the linkage with, with China. And we need, of course, transparency, but also we need good policies and a strategic vision in order to define what is the pros, what are the gains in the relationship with, uh, with China. We are close the time. Yes. Sorry. Finish? Five remarks. Some <laughs> remarks? Someone of you wants to do remark? You? Can, can, can I say a few words? One thing. One thing. You too? OK. Just not to, just to not leave uh, uh, President Iglesias' uh, uh, question without um, any comment, I think uh, um, the rationale for the BRICS Bank. Uh, there is no no in, no s single rationale for the BRICS Bank. I think each country has uh, its own reason to support the idea of the bank. Uh, if you think about how to, uh, wh why China is uh, 
uh, supporting the idea. Um, it's, my, it's my impression that China is uh, finding several ways to losing its own footprint uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the international system. Uh, and uh, a multilateral or minilateral bank would be a way to to, to lose, uh, just to uh, uh, hide, a, a kind of a hide uh, 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 beyond the bank. Uh, uh, I think for Brazil, uh, uh, the bank is important as an answer for the problem of uh, the World Bank and the IMF. I'm not saying that the bank can compete uh, with the World Bank and the, and the IMF, but it is the same rationale. If I don't have space in this system, and if this system seems to me to be unfair, I will try to build up another right. one in parallel to compete uh, uh, with the, the, um, the existing one. Uh, uh, as far as I heard, I'm not sure about India, but uh, as far as I heard about India, India uh, has interest in, find in funding its own projects. Uh, uh, India seems to be the country uh, which has a portfolio already. Uh, uh, done uh, to to present to the bank. Uh, South Africa, uh, South Africa's interest in the bank. Uh, it seems to me to be uh, to use the bank as a way to make uh, uh, to get a sp strong posi position within Africa. Uh, 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 so I, I, I do think you have several reasons to to support uh, the bank idea. I'm not convinced that the bank is a good idea uh, per se, uh, and my uh, worst fear is exactly the fact, the fact that uh, such a kind of institution and uh, the behavior of the BRICS within the existing, uh, uh, existing uh, institutions could weaken uh, the multilateral system in a way that could uh, uh, um, uh, make some, uh, uh, create some new problems for the BRICS countries themselves. Minute out now. <laughs> Just a quick comment. I think all these years, China gained a lot of tension, and this is uh, very, uh, very important for us. But China basically uh, is a more inward looking uh, type of country. Uh, we have uh, so many complicated things inside China, so we focus on our own uh, reform for so many years until after this uh, crisis and uh, we start to have more relationship with the world. Actually, we are new to this world and we want to understand more. Uh, but at the same time, it, for all kind of reasons, in this panel, we, we, we find that uh, compared with other developing countries, we're sort of outstanding. Uh, and uh, just after the crisis, just because the developing world get into their own trouble, so China appeared to be much more strong there, but we are not really that strong. Uh, in terms of the international uh, business, uh, in, in the Chinese company doing business uh, abroad, we're really new. We're not very uh, capable to do everything as the world really expected. We're not really <laughs> selfish, but we're capabilities is not there. But um, I don't. I don't want to say the world have to wait China to be stronger so that we can can be helpful. I think it's the most different between Chinese uh, or the uh, South countries multinational young multinational company with the existing very strong uh, the uh, developed countries multinational company uh, the gap of the capability is really strong so we cannot really ex exactly follow their step uh, if I think the world realize not only the government not only our academics if the our world Chinese and the other South countries world we realize that we do every every one of us we have half capability but we have the heart to cooperate to each other and then the people want to be together and then will create tremendous opportunity uh, you know we cannot only uh, sit and, and, and expect someone else is strong enough to come in I think that's that's very important in this um, this year in, in my forum inside China I happen to invite some of the cheating company inside there and I just it, say that you know we want to do the alliances uh, just because we, we are weak in terms of knowing this world. We're weak in knowing your country. And then the Chile company immediately re responds saying that actually we did not think about it before. Now if you need us, we want to be your partner. I think that's exactly the, the right way to go. So uh, we, we do want to all of us, uh, if we uh, have any energy, any approach, and then we want the country getting together, not only business, the people getting together, so that we can have our heart together, we can have the trust built, and then a tremendous, beautiful future we can create it. Thank you. Thank you very much, and with this uh, very, very intelligent and modest work, we are closing this panel. Thank you. Thank you.